So with that in mind, I'm going to invite our next speaker to come up. Our next speaker is a close personal friend and colleague. She's a wonderful clinician. She's helped teaching the future through running the core clerkship for the medical students. Um, she's a breast cancer surgeon. Jane Mendez, I'd like her to come up. She's an associate professor here at Boston University, and please give her a great round of applause. Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here and to see that the room is so full of bright minds and young people. So with that, um, I have no financial disclosures, unfortunately. Uh, so what I'd like to do over the next uh, you know, few minutes is uh, discuss breast cancer epidemiology and screening, advances and recent controversies in breast cancer, and then talk about some of the present and future challenges in the treatment of breast cancer. Uh, as you probably all know in this room, breast cancer is the most common cancer in women. It's the leading cause of cancer death in women ages 40 to 55. 12% of American women will be diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetime. That's the number one in eight that you see every October during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. 3.5% of women will die of the disease, and the likelihood of a woman getting breast cancer or was uh, the incidence increases with age. So even though women would like to forget about it, actually that's when we need to be most concerned about breast cancer. And this demonstrates that to you, in a current age and probability of developing breast cancer in the next 10 years in one at whatever number. So if you're in your 20s, you have a probability of one in 2050 to get breast cancer, pretty low. Look what happens when you're in your 40s, it's one out of 67. And when you're in your 70s, it's one out of 24. So just proving the point that the likelihood definitely increases as you age. And these are the most recent numbers from the American Cancer Society having to do with uh, breast cancer incidents as well as deaths in the United States. As you can see, it is the leading cause of cancer in women. It uh, accounts for 29% of all cancers in women, followed by lung and colon and rectal cancer. And as you can see, it's the second cause of cancer death in women, first one being lung. Anybody know why that is and not breast cancer? Why lung is so high? 26% of deaths in women are from lung cancer. What has happened over the past like 30 years? Smoking, right? More women have, in, you know, have started smoking and therefore the incidence of lung cancer has significantly increased in women. You can see here graphs of what's happened in terms of breast cancer as compared to other cancers um, you know, in women. Um, mammogram, which is our screening a gold standard, was introduced in the 1970s. And you can see that there's been a steep decrease in the likelihood of uh, breast cancer uh, deaths um, you know, in the last uh, 40 years. So it's because of all the screening, education, and awareness that has gone into place. And look, the opposite is happening with lung. They're going in opposite directions. And here you can see that the likelihood of developing breast cancer is affected by your ethnicity or your race. It's mostly a disease in Caucasian or white women, followed by black and then Pacific, uh, Pacific Islanders, Hispanic, and Native American uh, women. So, and now look at, picture that graph, and now picture this other one. This is the likelihood of dying from breast cancer. Much more likely to die from breast cancer if you're black or African American than if you are white or any of the other groups. Why is that? If it's the same disease, why should there be more deaths in the black or African American women as compared to all the others? Could it be biology? Could it be that we don't know how to treat them properly or that they come too late? Or is it a combination of all these factors? Keep that in mind. So we know that all the way from prevention or the way to survival and mortality in the breast cancer spectrum, there's a very complex interaction of biologic along with economic and socioeconomic uh, issues. 
And obviously, that might affect part of the graph that we saw in the earlier slide. And get ready. We're going to go for a ride. Fasten your seat belts. And we're going to go. Ah! My scream didn't come, but it was supposed to come a scream, OK? But it didn't come. Where's my sound? Well, you guys were supposed to be all screaming, so fasten your seat belts. OK, you got the point. So breast cancer is mostly sporadic in nature. 85% of breast cancer, the woman that I have in front of me is the first woman in her family to have it. There's no associated mutation or any gene associated with it. Only 10% are familial and 5% hereditary. So one of the most important myths, you know, myth that I have to dispel in my clinic is that when the woman comes tell me, I don't have anybody with a breast cancer in my family, I shouldn't worry about it. Wrong. 85% are sporadic in nature. They're the first ones. Okay, so make sure that if you keep one lesson today, that's very important. Furthermore, we know that one or two women, you know, will actually, when they detect a breast mass, that's actually an emergency. You feel a lump, they want it taken care of yesterday. It's very anxiety provoking. First thing you think, I have breast cancer, okay? And there's a sense of urgency about these symptoms. It doesn't matter what I tell that woman in front of me. As long as you feel a lump, it is an emergency. Therefore, it is my job as a breast surgeon to find out and I have a fundamental task to help this woman figure out if this mass is benign or if it's malignant. Because that way, I, we can decide on a treatment course accordingly. I can reassure her, or if it's indeed something that is concerning for malignancy, then we need to do the appropriate workup. But everything that I'm going to be talking to you this morning and this afternoon, just keep in mind that I have a patient in front of me, and we're trying to figure out things so that we can help this woman figure out whether this is going to change her life or this is just going to be nothing to worry about. So with that, the gold standard for breast cancer screening is mammography. And uh, we do actually uh, two views on each side uh, in the mammogram. And here you can see the abnormality is actually pointed by the arrow. In this one case, there were some calcifications. Those minute little specks, which are usually very different sizes and shapes, and that's something that we can pick up in the mammogram. Usually when we have this, is the earliest manifestation of a malignancy. But those are the minute changes that we can find from one mammogram as compared to the other to help us figure out if things are changing. So the guidelines currently by the American Cancer Society is that every woman needs a mammogram starting at age 40 and annually thereafter, okay? In addition to that, most of you in the room, ages 20 to 39, you just need to get your doctor to examine you at least every three years, and then you need to do your monthly self-exam. But for women 40 and over, it's going to be annually. And as I said, it's done two views on each side. They compress up and down and side to side, uh, and we get the two pictures on each breast. So it's a total of four pictures uh, for each woman, and that's all processed. Now we have computer aid to help us compare different images, so the old mammogram to the new mammogram, and we have computer aid to help us detect if there's any subtle differences in the tissue or the shape. This is a mammogram, and here you can see on the right-hand side is an ultrasound. So sometimes we use other technologies, the ultrasound waves via sound waves, so it helps us determine if the mass is cystic or if it's solid. So if I see this on the mammogram, I see that there's indeed a mass that looks pretty irregular uh, in the breast. So by getting the ultrasound, I can get more details in terms of its shape and the fact that it is indeed solid. Because if it was fluid filled and a cyst, I wouldn't need to worry about it. I can reassure the woman. But if it's solid, as in this case, then I can take a little piece of tissue with a needle biopsy and I bought some gadgets so you can take a look. So after we find that on the ultrasound, we can do what I call core biopsies. And this is one of the core biopsy devices. I have it um, go around. 
And with this, we can take multiple tissue specimens from the mass that we're looking under the ultrasound, so then we can send it to the laboratory. So we can get more information, get more answers, get to the bottom line of my question, if this malignant or if this benign, okay? And the downside of this one, I'll tell you, is that um, for this one, each time I put it in, I can only take one specimen. So keep that in mind. With this one, is more elaborate, as you can see. This is a vacuum-assisted device. And the beauty of this one is you can insert it once, and you can take multiple samples by rotating, but you only have to do one puncture. And over time, the size of these devices has greatly you know, has increased, so we can take bigger cores. What we call is a core what, that we get is the size of this specimen is getting bigger and bigger so we can get better analysis and more information from just that tissue. So I'll pass this around so you guys can take a look and probably think of new designs to make things better, okay? So you can pass them around everywhere. And at the end, I'll take them with me because if not, the radiologist will kill me. Okay, so, and you might recall in 2009, there was a significant controversy when the United States Preventive Task Force decided to change the recommendations for mammography screening. You know, they wanted it to start at age 50 and to be every two years, and the women 40 to 50 to be individualized, and for it to stop at age 70. Well, there was great opposition at the time. It created great concern in the public, and I have to say that to this date, there has been no change in the recommendations. So the recommendations stay, as I ex you know, explained earlier, mammogram annually at age 40. Ma you know, ma major organizations across the country, American Cancer Society, College of Radiology, American College of Surgeons, American Society of Breast Surgeons, everybody opposed it, so they have not been changed, okay? So mammogram still at age 40 and annually thereafter. I wanted to say uh, one or two words about MRI. MRI is a technology that we sometimes use for further assessment of the breast. Different from mammogram is not for screening purposes because to date, the technology that we have has 24% of false positives, which is really high. So an area that could use some improvement when it comes to breast cancer diagnosis is trying to come up with better imaging that leads to less false positives, okay? And now they're also trying to see if we can combine not only imaging, but also uh, kind of uh, physiology and changes in temperature because some people have postulated that when you have a breast cancer, there's a higher temperature in that part of the tissue. So there's something that's called thermography that has been used in the past. So interesting technologies, but this is not for screening because again, is there too many false positives, so it would lead to unnecessary anxiety and a lot of unnecessary testing. But for a specific group of patients, we might order it if it's indicated. For, for the time being, ladies and gentlemen, the big squeeze will remain as the gold standard up until one of you in here develops a better technology that will be good for screening, cost-effective, and have very little uh, in terms of false positives. So breast of exam, I just wanted to mention it just because it's important for the woman to be familiar for her, with her breast. If not, how do you know what has changed? And about 30, in 33% of breast cancer cases is the woman who's palpated the abnormality who then comes forward to the physician. So it's important to know. What are you looking for? Changes on the skin, any changes on the nipple, any changes in terms of nipple discharge, any change in the shape, any retraction, any fullness that's, uh, that's new. And then you couple that with the clinical breast exam, which should be done at least once a year for the women. And not every lump is a mat, not every lump is cancer, and I have to make that clear. Some benign lesions, such as fibroadenoma, it could be a cyst, it could be an infectious process or an abscess, it could be just nodularity that we refer to as fibrocystic disease that changes with the menstrual cycle, and indeed it could be a tumor. So again, I go to that fundamental task, is it malignant or is it benign, but I cannot assume. 
One thing that I've seen that for it needs help is a lot of uh, the time, a young woman comes in and she has a lump, she's 22. And uh, they say, oh, it's probably benign because you're 22. And they don't do any biopsy, they don't do any imaging. Well, I had one of those 22 year olds and six months later when she came to see me as a breast specialist, I not only could I feel the lung, but I could also feel lymph nodes in her axilla. Why? Nothing had ever been done for her, and it was indeed a breast cancer. That's the youngest breast cancer patient I have ever diagnosed, but you need to do the workup, and it's really easy to do it, as I've just you know, been talking to you this afternoon, so we need to get tissue diagnosis, and that's gonna be critical. So how we know who's at risk for breast cancer? Well, the two main risk factors for breast cancer, being a woman and getting older. Not a good deal, right? So, um, and with that, there's also, um, we can define them as modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors for breast cancer. So these are the things that you cannot change. You cannot change your gender in terms of uh, your chromosomal um, makeup. We cannot change our aging process. If you have a personal family his or history of breast cancer, you cannot change it. If you have a genetic predisposition because you have one of the identified genes, you cannot change that. Radiation exposure, if you're unfortunate enough to live in a place that was an atomic bomb or some radiation exposure, you know, you cannot change that. Having your period at an early age or having your period at a very late age or having kids at a late age, you cannot change most of these things. However, you can change indeed all of these things. Diet, sedentary lifestyle, alcohol, environmental exposure. Okay, so th these are among the things that we can change. I'll go back to this slide just to talk about BRCA1 and CR2. BR is breast cancer related gene. One and two are the most commonly known and we can check for this with a genetic test. And we can actually do the whole gene sequencing. But these are just two of other genes, many other genes that are associated with breast cancer. So if I have somebody in my office who I identify as having a high risk for breast cancer because of their family history, I'm gonna send them for genetic counseling so that then they can get properly assessed to see if they meet any of these criteria to be part of any of these potential syndromes where breast cancer can be a part of. And some red flags for hereditary uh, breast, you know, BRCA1 or 2 is breast cancer before age 50, any ovarian cancer in their family, male breast cancer at any age, and Ashkenazi Jewish ascendants. We know that in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, there's a preponderance of the BRCA1 and 2 genes so we're going to be really concerned in that specific patient population. So with diet, we have to make healthy choices because that's something we can control and is modifiable. So unfortunately, all the Big Macs and Burger Kings are gonna need to go. And there has been an association between obesity and the estrogen levels in your body. Okay, so we've learned a lot more about the pathophysiology of breast cancer and we know that more obese women have higher levels of estrogen, which can lead to higher likelihood of developing breast cancer. So exercise is important, needless to say. We don't want these Rubinesque figures because they're certainly at a disadvantage because of our said of the link between obesity and breast cancer. Alcohol, you can have papers both arguing that indeed it's a link some that it doesn't, some people believe that the red wine contains phenolic acids that actually help decrease the likelihood of breast cancer. And I think ultimately if you drink too much, you're gonna die of your liver and not of the breast. So perhaps you die young enough to develop any breast cancer. How about cigarette smoking? How many of you think there's a link between breast cancer and cigarette smoking? Raise your hand if you think there is. Okay, well, there's been no direct link between, bre between breast cancer and smoking. However, anybody who comes to my clinic, I'm going to adhere and promote good lifestyle habits and I'm gonna keep them or try to have them uh, stop smoking. But there's no link like there is between lung cancer and smoking. 
And another one that patients are really, really worried all the time, caffeine. What do you think? Is it a link? I see a lot of coffee around here. <laughs> well, luckily there's not, okay? But that's another one. It's indeed linked with breast pain. And again, why the mechanism? What is the mechanism of action? I do not know. But caffeine does not increase the likelihood for breast cancer. So I'll be very happy the day this happens, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, did I have my mammogram? Why do you ask? OK? And then that's what I call the pancake effect, OK? And the women, yes, sometimes they complain of pain. And that's another area where we can potentially improve the technology that we have right now because they have to squeeze, as I said, up and down and side to side. So for certain women, it can be a very painful experience, which keeps them from coming to get their mammogram. So could we possibly devise some other mechanism by which we can get the same uh, information without the squeezing and the pain associated with it? So that's something that we can work on. Now I want to change gears momentarily and talk more about the surgical aspects of it. And you know, breast cancer was first described all the way to 1600 BC. This is the Edwin Papyrus. And there's been a significant evolution over the past 40 years in terms of what's the, been the treatment and management for breast cancer. Here on this left side, I may introduce you to Sir John Halstead. He was a very famous surgeon in the 1970s. And he was the father of the radical procedures for breast cancer. He actually removed absolutely everything to treat the patients with breast cancer. He removed the breast with all the lymph nodes under the axilla, along with both muscles, the pectoralis major and pectoralis minor, that sit behind the breast. You can only imagine the cosmetic you know, deformity in those patients, as well as over 40% of those patients develop swelling of their arm over time. Not good quality of life. Then, in the 1980s, going into the 1990s, there's uh, Dr. Uh, Bernard Fisher and Dr. Umberto Veronesi. Veronesi worked in the Milan at the European Oncology Institute. Dr. Bernard Fisher, he worked in the University of Pittsburgh. And they challenged those dogmas, because why should we be so radical? So then they said, and I know you already had your lecture about chemotherapy. Then they said, why can we start using systemic treatment in addition to the surgery to try to minimize what we have to do from the surgical standpoint, because more is not necessarily better. So sure enough, that was the whole stadium principles that more is better versus Fisher's systemic approach. Let's try to combine different therapies to see if we can do less surgery but still have great outcomes. So that led to many different clinical trials and from the 1970 to 2012, now we are not only doing less surgery in terms of the breast, now we're doing minimal surgery. We're removing only the area with the known tumor, what we call as breast conserving treatment. We're adding chemotherapy, sometimes radiation. And we no longer remove all the lymph nodes anymore. Now, with the use of technology, we can try to see which is the first node that the cancer travels to, what's called the central node, and take just that one node out, leaving all the others in place unless that one has cancer. Okay? So why expose everybody to unnecessary surgery if it's not going to contribute to the overall outcome? Again, more was not necessarily better. So why have we been able to evolve? Because we've been challenging dogma. We've been proving with clinical trials where we need to go, proving that indeed the combination of the multidisciplinary treatment is key to really be successful at treating breast cancer. So I couldn't do my work as a surgeon without the chemotherapy, without the radiation oncology, without the plastic surgeons, the pathologists. I mean, and now the foundation, as you're going to see, is all at the level of the pathology, because we're learning so much more about the biology than when we can tailor therapy and tailored treatment too. If it's more aggressive, it's less aggressive. And did they have to talk about radiation all already? Yeah. Excellent, so then, so now you understand now we're integrating radiation with chemotherapy, with surgery, so I can maximize the cure. So surgery alone is not good enough. We need to maximize with all the different treatment options. 
So the state of the art is, as I said, the, the uh, core biopsy device, which is getting a little specimen so that we can get the answer that we're looking for. That is the state of the art. Before I take the patient to the operating room and I can make use of my scalpel, okay, I need to know what the patient has. Because if it's benign, I don't need to do an operation. And if it's malignant, then I need to do a bigger operation and check the lymph nodes. So these are some more <clears throat> for you guys to take a look at. <clears throat> there we go. So this is the state of the art, and the radiologists are the ones doing this procedure. So how many of you think that if I remove everything doing a mastectomy, it's better than if I just remove the tumor and give radiation along with it? Raise your hand if you think a mastectomy will be better. Okay, and if you think that the combination of surgery and radiation, it's as good, raise your hand. Awesome, you guys are correct, okay? So basically, we have now up to 25 years of follow-up because of those forefathers of modern breast surgery that I introduced you earlier, Dr. Umberto Veronesi and Dr. Fisher. We've shown that removing all the breasts or removing just the area with the tumor and adding radiation has the same survival as when we, um, we remove everything. So there's no uh, difference between the two. Therefore, we can freely, all factors being equal, patients do have a choice, okay? And all because those 40 years of work that I talked to you about earlier. And the most, one of the most important aspects is that Sentinel node that I discussed to you, the one where you, we only remove the one node that has, um, is the Sentinel node. We do that for staging, we do that for determining local treatment, and also to try us to determine the patient's survival. And this has revolutionized the outcome for these patients because it's minimally invasive, it has very little side effects, and ultimately, that's what I'm trying to avoid. This lady had the radical procedure in the 1970s. You can see that's what I don't want to do. And we don't do that anymore. Now you understand why. And look at his heart arm as compared to the other arm. That's called lymphedema. Okay? So that's why more is not necessarily better. So now we're pushing the envelope even further. And now some people are asking, well, why do we even need to check the lymph nodes? Because if we are giving radiation to that area as part of our treatment, it will treat whatever is in the lymph node. And if it's not going to make a difference in terms of the patient's survival, and chemotherapy is treating the lymph node as well. So perhaps in the next few years, checking the lymph nodes will become obsolete, and it will become a dinosaur. Okay. But I just wanted to bring this up to your attention just because step by step, we're learning more and more about the biology. The different technologies help us do less but getting better outcomes and better patient quality of life. And that's the right approach. Okay, so this lecture might be really, really different, let's say even two years from now. So it used to be very simple. It used to be that patients got surgery, they follow chemo, radiation, and then look at very little different chemotherapeutic agents that we had available for our use, and look at it now. Sometimes we give the chemotherapy and the radiation before surgery. Sometimes we give hormonal pills prior to surgery. Look at all the different options that we have and targets for the chemotherapy and ultimately um, we try to tailor the therapy. So not everybody gets the same. So it's the whole alphabet soup <clears throat> that we have available for chemotherapeutic agents. So we've gone through as maximally tolerable to as minimally effective, anatomical to as biologically appropriate, traditional medicine. Now we have evidence-based reasons to what we do, what we do, from science to surgical practice. So that's why it's so important for you to be here today because this is where in the innovation comes into place so that we can continue to improve that quality of life and obviously ultimately decrease uh, breast cancer overall. So we've seen that the pendulum has moved 
from one side and the other side, and then I'm hypnotizing you. <clears throat> and we've gone from the microscope and just the pathology, just looking at tumor size, grade, lymph node, patient age, we've actually moved now to what we call our a black box. And this black box is actually the biology. We don't know much about those differences I alluded to earlier. Why do the African American women have worse mortality as compared to the others? Do they have a more aggressive breast cancer? So the Human Genome Project was actually great, and this explosion of genetic information has led us to the next level as we move forward in this breast cancer continuum. Because it's allowed us to move from just the pathology to multi-gene predictors and platforms and gene arrays that we can take a look at so we can better understand what's happening at the biologic level. And rather than two main types of breast cancer that we thought we had, ductal and lobular, now we know that there's great biologic heterogeneity and that indeed there's many different subtypes of breast cancer. And these are five of the subtypes that have been identified, luminal A, B, HER2 type, basal cell, and clotting. And as you can see, when you break it down by subtype, there's a clear cut in a relationship between the time to spread and the overall survival by subtype. The luminal A and B, which is your blue and your uh, aqua, do great. But look what happens with your HER2, which is the purple pretty bad, and the red is the basal, otherwise known as triple negative, that is also pretty poor. And I have to say that up, even now in 2012, we found two magic targets. We have a magic target for the luminal A and the luminal B. We have a magic target for the one that's the HER2 type. We found something that is specific, minimal side effects, and the patients do great. But the basal type, we have nothing. Nothing that does garden variety surgery, garden variety chemotherapy and radiation, nothing specific that we've been able to target. So right now, that is the holy grail in breast cancer treatment. They've looked at many different options because this is the number one killer in breast cancer uh, in women. And in this, we know there's also a correlation between this one and the ones that have BRCA1 mutation. So they're looking right now at the PARP inhibitors as a possible mechanism to try to get to the cancer cell in these specific patients. And also they're looking at some anti-EGFR um, added to some uh, already being used chemotherapy carboplatin to see if it has any use. But this is a very, very active area of research because this is where we lose most of our breast cancer patients in 2012. And interestingly, there's been multiple studies showing that the African-American women have a higher likelihood of developing this specific type of cancer, which is the one that we have nothing specific for. So perhaps the graph that I showed you earlier having to do with the higher mortality has to do with the fact that we're dealing with different biology. Okay? So we, that black box in terms of the biology is we're learning a lot more now with this human genome project and the genomic profiling so that we can start to see that not one size fits all, not even at the level of the biology. So this might give us some additional answers as we continue the research. So from the microscope, we move to the genomic uh, profiling, and this has helped us define optimal therapy, avoid over-treatment. Again, we live in uh, healthcare with cost containment. We don't want to treat somebody if it's not gonna help them. So we try to uh, keep a balance between tailored therapy and over-treatment and stratify patients. So with that, there's, this is one of the biggest additions to our clinical practice in the last uh, decade. This is called the oncotype. If you can picture the following, 
They took uh, the uh, generic, generic uh, literature different arrays, and this group from the NSABP, they identified 21 genes. As you can see, they're related to different parts of the breast cancer cell proliferation, invasion, HER2, herestrogen, and five were reference genes. And with this super duper complicated formula that I hope you all memorize by the end of this slide, they calculate a risk assessment. And this recurrence risk is clearly correlated to the likelihood whether the patient will have a recurrence or not of their breast cancer. And why is this important? Because we've been using this to try to help us decide who needs chemotherapy or not. So for those patients who have a very high risk, then we know those patients will likely benefit from chemotherapy, so we'll give them the chemotherapy. And if they have a low risk, we know that they have pretty good likelihood of not developing any further problems, so we can omit the chemotherapy. So it's given us a better assessment rather than just the oncologist trying to figure out in their own head and their judgment. At least we have something that's evidence-based that we can m help the patients make that decision. So basically, the question of chemo versus no chemo, now we have more substance to help the patients decide if they're going to benefit or not and if it's worthwhile because there's side effects associated with the chemotherapy. And I'm sure Dr. Blanchard yesterday spoke to you about all the issues with the chemotherapy in terms of the side effects and the length of time that it takes to deliver the chemotherapy regimen. So it's, it's a very important decision that we have to make for our patients. So now I think I'm going to take a different look, and since I have a lot of different engineers in the room and people involved in science, I think that we are part of the innovation and the new solution as we move forward in that whole spectrum of breast cancer treatment and outcomes. And I want to come up with some ideas and ideas. And in this whole spectrum, let's see where we might make a difference. Well, in early detection, we need better screening tests. As I told you, mammogram is not perfect. So anything that we can do to try to improve our screening for breast cancer would be great. Less painful, and I already touched upon that. Because if it's going to be a deterrent to the woman getting her screening study, then right there we've lost a significant percent of women who if it's gonna, if it's gonna hurt, they're not going to show for the mammogram every year. Increased sensitivity. Well, we know that mammogram doesn't work as well when the woman has a very dense breast because it cannot really see through the tissue. So doing some other technology that you can really assess what's happening in terms of whether it's dense breast or not so dense, when it's fatty, it, that would be really helpful. Uh, also, we need to have, if there was something uh, achieved to try to determine if the woman is at risk, so we can do some type of uh, analysis to determine if it's at risk or not, that would be helpful. When it comes to diagnosis and the incidence, well, we've already talked a little bit about the incorporation of the molecular and genetic profiling, and also MRI has too many false positives. If we could do something on it with some other technology that decreases the number of false positives so we can avoid all the unnecessary anxiety and testing. Treatment. One of the main challenges when you're doing breast cancer surgery is the margins. That means that all the borders so what we remove are free of cancer because we don't want to leave any cancer cells behind. So some have tried light, perhaps something with spectrometry, and you can see, you can use at the time of the operating when you have the cavity and it's open, perhaps through the deflection of light, trying to see if there's still tumor cells left behind. Perhaps, I don't know, we could assess what's happening with the cavity so that we can then know whether we have residual disease or not and avoid an unnecessary operation because if my borders are too close, and I only find that two weeks later with the final pathology report is another operation and another anesthesia for the patient. So being able to assess intraoperatively with something very accurate what the margin status is is something that would be helpful. Use of intraoperative radiation. Well, usually the patient has the surgery and then 
six weeks they receive radiation. For six weeks, every day, Monday through Friday. So some individuals are looking at, can we deliver the radiation intraoperatively? So while the cavity is open, we come with our radiation device, deliver the radiation, protecting other tissues that obviously we don't want to be affected, such as the skin, the lungs, and the heart, so that we can deliver it, and it's what we call one-stop shopping. So we can do something like that. They have some devices, but they're not perfect. And they even have some cavitary um, devices that we can put in place for that use as well. One of the more interesting areas now is stem cells. And what role these stem cells really play in the microenvironment around the breast cancer? Because some people have postulated now that it might be the stem cells in the microenvironment leading to the changes that ultimately result in the cancer. Very interesting area of research right now. That's the extent of my knowledge. I just heard a talk about it, but that's an area of innovation. Specific targets for the triple negative, I told you, that's our holy grail. Identify new targets in breast cancer, other parts of the cancer cell that we have not yet explored. And then breast prosthesis design. I brought some so you can see. This is what women use. Can you imagine? Okay, so we can model something that's easier to use and more natural-like would be great, you know, different materials for prosthesis. And I'm almost done, Dr. Rosen. So design better prosthesis. And one hot area right now is how can we assess the outcome? Because obviously I look at my patient, you know, when, every time they come to clinic, but now we're trying to measure outcome in terms of cosmesis. So the other day I heard there might be some computer programs where they take in, we take a picture of the patient's appearance you know, after surgery, whether she had reconstruction or not, and then with a computer model, we can gauge what's, the, you know, what's her outcome with certain gradation as, as designed by this computer model. Okay, so these are areas that are becoming very important because they're going to have quality measures in surgery, and one of them is going to be cosmesis. So computer programs of that nature will be really helpful to try to determine again, the success when it comes to cosmesis. And with that, and prevention, computer models to ascend cancer risk, and the microenvironment analysis, the stem cells and ATP and everything else around the breast that leads ultimately to the cancer development. So with that, we can hopefully, with all your ideas, and eventually we'll be able to imagine a world free of breast cancer. So with that, thank you very much. <laughs>
and it is even uh, African American women with insurance and the same access to care tend to have inferior outcomes and higher mortality as compared to the Caucasian women. Okay. Uh, question number two uh, was indeed that's why I'm here because I want to serve an underserved population and that's we, why well, we have a Boston Medical Center. So we see a lot of these women with later stages of breast cancer at presentation just because of their issues. And we see a significant number of Hispanic, African-American women, and actually women from all over the world. And I do tend to see larger tumors and worse prognosis as compared to my uh, counterparts in the other part of the city, okay? And then prevention is becoming very tricky. A, both breast cancer is very multifactorial. And furthermore, as we continue to learn about the biology and the subtypes, it turns out that what we knew about all the risk factors, that's all for hormonally related estrogen-driven cancers. So some individuals are questioning now that perhaps for the women that are triple negative or the HER2, that they have nothing having to do with estrogen-driven breast cancer, perhaps we need to look at a whole different set of risk factors that we have not been looking at. So that list that I showed you might be completely not applicable to the triple negatives and the ones that are at HER2 because they're not, dri you know, they're not driving the cancer with the estrogen. So this is all work in progress, very interesting and dynamic area of research. Oh, one of the things that I enjoyed about your talk was you phrased things in terms of questions. When we have a question, why is breast cancer different in um, African American women? Uh, why is it that some patients we treat, they recur and other patients don't? So I, I like the way that she, you presented it in terms of asking questions and not being satisfied. Yeah, and part of the reason that genetic array that I showed you came up and it's been, um, you know, it's in clinical practice, is that we know that up until this uh, came to use, 90% of women with breast cancer were being treated and less than 10% derived a benefit. So can you imagine the exposure to all the toxic effects of the chemotherapy when less than 10% of those women were actually benefiting from the treatment? So that's why there was an area of need to try to tailor therapy so we could avoid the overtreatment. So that's where we're heading now to try to tailor and avoid that overtreatment that leads to excessive costs, not only quality of life, but also healthcare dollars. Do we have other questions? Mm -hmm. I see. Oh. Oh. Uh, thank you again for the for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, given the huge side effect of the chemotherapy, so uh, what are the important factors uh, would you take into consideration? Um, uh, should you determine whether a uh, certain patient would be taken proceeded to chemotherapy after surgical removal? Um, uh, can you name a few important ones other than the uh, uh, the oncotype gene uh, uh, recurrence score, as you just talked about. Perfect. Yes. Before the uh, oncotype, the X recurrence score was available. Basically, we based that decision on the basis of the tumor size, whether the lymph nodes had cancer or not, the grade of the tumor, and the woman's age. And on the basis of that, we made that determination, but it was not evidence based. And I have to mention that the Oncotype, the X recurrence scores, the um, test that we use primarily in these states, but there's another similar uh, uh, product that can be used. It's called the MamaPrint. It uses 70 genes, and it was developed in the Netherlands. Very different patient population, very different set of genes that it looks at in its, as, in its test. However, this is an area of the great you know, competition right now because they want to see who has the best product to try to help in the decision-making process of chemo versus no chemo, okay? And interestingly also, when you take a look at all the different genetic signatures and profiles that they've discovered for breast cancer, there's less than 80% concordance amongst all the genes that they use. So what some people have proposed now, instead of looking at the specific genes for genes, looking at the biologic pathways that those genes represent, so then we can find targets for therapy. 
rather than this gene or that other gene. So now we're looking at biologic pathways that we can identify new targets when it comes to therapeutic opportunities. Can you put a comment on uh, the current, like, quantitative kind of analysis uh, to determine uh, the, the, the risk of taking chemo uh, as opposed to the previously experienced base? Uh, um, in terms of patient side effects? Um, in terms of the accuracy, like, uh, yeah, yes, side effect. Or there is no accuracy, and we don't know. Uh, which patients will respond and which, you know, who will not respond to the treatment. So what we have tried now is they have some devices where you can put the tumor, you know, like tumor tissue and try different types of chemotherapeutic agents even before the patients start therapy. So you can start to figure out which one might be best. But we have a limited armamentarium available. And we have also limited knowledge of the biology. So that's why the Human Genome Project has really led us to the next level, so we can find the subtleties. You know, up until 10 years ago, subtypes weren't unheard of. Okay, so I just want you to realize it's been 40 years of evolution and challenging of ideas and research. Well, a follow-up question to that. Um, because I, I know you're involved at the national level on this, can you comment at all on, say, some of the ACASOG or NSABP clinical trials and what role the surgeon is playing in making decisions on treatment regimens? Yeah, so there's a very strong move now to have the tissue banks because most of the studies that are going to be now at the national level, we want to have tissue so that we can used for collateralized stories so that we can do things as you're suggesting, see if it works or it doesn't work for new ideas. So every single protocol now that gets started in the country will need to have a tissue bank and tissue um, you know, preserved for further research so we can continue to answer these questions. And also collaboration, because research dollars, I mean, have become so scarce that collaboration has become really important so actually, recently, three of the major groups having to do with medical oncology and surgery joined in one big group called the Alliance because they recognize that, A, we need, each, we need to work together and we need to collaborate because there's scarce resources. We can probably take one more question. I'm going to choose, uh, uh oh, okay, one here, two more questions. One here, one now. Here we go. Hi, fantastic talk, thank you very much. A uh, quick question on, uh, if you could elaborate uh, a little bit on uh, the reasons why you would move away from sentinel, if not biopsy, that could help for treatment planning post-surgery. Okay, good question. That's being challenged, okay? The main issue is that February last year, a major study was published. They took a look at women with breast cancer that had tumors that were five centimeters or less. All of these women, for the most part, received chemotherapy, and they also received radiation as part of their treatment, okay? And they all had just the tumor removed. Then they did sentinel from biopsy in all those patients, and then they randomized them to either having an observation or all their other lymph nodes removed once they were proven to have cancer on the sentinel node, which is the standard practice right now. Well, after years of follow-up, 5.6 years of follow-up, they actually showed that there was no survival advantage to removal of all the other lymph nodes, okay? So now, since people want to challenge dogma, some say, well, we know that in elderly women, those above, you know, they're proposing about 65, perhaps we know that they usually have pretty indolent cancers why even check the lymph nodes to begin with if it's not going to make a difference down the line? So that's still being challenged. And there actually somebody nice proposing that as a protocol uh, yet to be approved. Main restraint is from the radiation oncologist. Why? Because the radiation oncologists want an area that's free of cancer. And they don't want to worry about having tumor deposits still in the axilla 
because their treatment might not be as effective. So they're getting a lot of push down from the radiation oncologist, but the group, the alliance group, is really pushing for this to move forward again because we're pushing the envelope. But so it's not practice right now. I, I'm going to have to cut it off there because we do have our next speaker. But thank you very much, thank Dr. you for Mendes, having for me. Back. And done. please, can you let's make oh, sure that yes. all the tools, all my gadgets, back. yes, all the gadgets. To my friend, Ray Ray Rallodies. <laughs>